Retail shopping is challenging. Sometimes you need a new set of golf clubs, a sectional sofa, and a wedding dress. And where are you gonna get all that? I'll tell you where. A power center. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Although this week, it might seem like we're talking about neither, but trust me, it's all connected. And this is a viewer suggested topic, and I really just want you to put your suggestions down in the comments. But I got this one through email and from someone sliding into my Insta DMs. This is actually a little weird. I'm hiding usernames to protect the innocent, but the Instagram message said, hey Ray, possible video idea? I'm currently in Edmonton, Canada at one of those mega suburb shopping areas, wondering about other perpetrators of poor land use. The amount of parking in these places is staggering. And then the email from a completely different user goes, was wondering if you could put your nerd brain to power centers. I live near Edmonton, which boasts the largest indoor shopping mall and probably the world's largest rat maze. South Edmonton Common. Okay, this is already so good, but then they both sent me like basically the same screenshot from their phone. Is this some kind of conspiracy or is it just Canada? Well, I don't have an Edmonton trip in my budget this year, but let me just say South Edmonton Common, you are making quite the impression on my viewers. So this is gonna be the first in a recurring series I'm gonna do on heinous land uses where I'm gonna look at a case study and talk about what makes it terrible. And this week we are venturing into the world of power centers. So first let's get our footing with some definitions. First of all, what is a power center? Well, according to the world's foremost source of unquestionably factual information, a power center is a shopping center with 250,000 to 600,000 square feet of gross leasable area that usually contains three or more big box anchor tenants and various smaller retailers where the anchors occupy 75 to 90% of the total area. Okay, good. So what's a big box? There's probably a widely accepted answer to this that you can Google yourself, but I'll just give you my point of view, which is, it is what it sounds like. It's a large, cheaply constructed three-dimensional shell where they sell stuff. It could be a store that specializes in a very particular retail segment, in which case we would call it a category killer, which is a retailer that specializes in and carries a deep product assortment within a given category and through selection, pricing, and market penetration obtains a massive competitive advantage over other retailers. But a big box can also be a store that just carries everything, in which case we might call it a discount superstore. The forerunner of this type of big box was the department store, but not like Macy's or Dillard's, but outfits like Sears Roebuck and Montgomery Ward that did business on low prices and high volume. But really, year zero in the history of US big box stores is 1962. That was the year the first Kmart opened, the first Target opened, and the first Walmart opened. Just stop and think about that for a minute. Imagine everything that was going on in the American zeitgeist 60 years ago that led to three different companies deciding that selling cheap goods to working class suburban families was a winning concept. And two of those companies are still going gangbusters. Fast forward to 1986, what's widely understood to be year of opening of the world's first power center. This is 280 Metro Center, it's still going strong today, and it pioneered the idea of collecting a bunch of big box stores around the perimeter of a massive service parking lot. And like just about every other invention that's massively enhanced our quality of life and vastly improved the way society functions, it originated in the Bay Area. That's the background, and what I'm gonna do today is a case study of the power center. I'll talk about how they're designed, how they relate to surrounding land uses, and how all of that impacts our communities and the way we get around. So let's get oriented. We're in the southeast quadrant of the Las Vegas Valley, and our study area just has a lot going on. 
I'm gonna say we have a traditional shopping mall, a pretty substantial hotel casino, and like five different power centers, depending on how you count. I'm not gonna go through each power center geographically because who cares? But I'll just give you a brief overview of all the category killers we're dealing with. Home improvement stores, home furnishing stores, several different artsy craftsy stores. So I don't think that category's quite been slain yet. Lots and lots of apparel stores, furniture stores, pet supplies, wine, golf, bridal, outdoorsy stuff. It goes on and on. And what I still don't understand is how some of these places stay in business when the discount superstores mostly carry the same stuff. I mean, how do you have a barbecue category killer when the sidewalk in front of Home Depot looks like this? And I do think there is a book category killer, but you're not gonna find it at a power center. Okay, we have to talk about mattress stores because they were everywhere in the study area. Let's do some math real quick. The replacement timeline for a mattress is seven to 10 years. Thanks, Google. So let's say a 10th of the metro area population, so like 200,000 people, live in the catchment area of this retail zone. Let's say each human needs to shop for a new mattress every 10 years. This assumes that the average mattress occupancy rate is a number that's larger than one. So that means 20,000 people are buying a mattress this year. Divided by the days in a year, that's 55 people a day who are in the market for a new mattress. Well, the study area has three different best mattress locations, three different mattress firm locations, a sleep number, a bunch of other furniture stores that probably sell mattresses, and all the discount superstores sell mattresses too, not to mention like Macy's. So if there are 55 people buying mattresses today, how are there three locations each of two different mattress store chains within a half mile radius? How is that even viable? If someone out there has deep insight on the mattress retail industry, leave me a comment below because I have just got to get to the bottom of this. Remember that it's not just big boxes. Power centers are an ecosystem that supports smaller category killers too. You know, more specialized commodities like boba tea and psychic powers, zen with no contracts, water, puppies. And people get hungry when they're shopping for water and puppies. So for dining, you've got a lot of the usual suspects, typical American fare, but also the ethnic cuisine of Australia, if you're feeling adventurous. And then I love this one. The pedestrian accommodations in power centers are routinely awful, but you've got this great delineated walkway that gets you from the Texas Roadhouse to the Golden Corral. Don't get me wrong, I'm all for trip chaining, you know, parking in one place and then going to multiple destinations on foot. But let's be real, if you're actually going to both of these places on the same trip, you should get like a gold star and I don't know, like a free consultation with a gastroenterologist. And all right, Cheesecake Factory isn't actually in the study area, unfortunately, but there was some pretty healthy discussion in the comments of last week's video. In fact, I think it's still popping off. All I'm gonna say is, menu thicker than a Tolstoy novel? And is there even an accepted academic term for this kind of architecture? I'm thinking postmodern Epstein Island Rococo. All right, before we leave the food category, let's acknowledge one of the true pinnacles of American ingenuity, the multi-lane fast food drive through Well, except for this in and out on Sunset just off the 515 interchange, which is only one lane, what were they thinking? They literally have to cone off all the parking to create queuing space for all the cars. This is a sure sign of a healthy society. Okay, we've talked about what's contained in a power center, so let's talk about how they're designed. I guess I don't mean architecturally. Do people actually have to be credentialed to design these places? The key feature of a power center is really that they look basically the same everywhere you go. They want it to look predictable and familiar, and therefore there is no unique sense of place. So really, the main, I don't know, architectural feature of any power center is the parking lot. 
it has to be enormous and it has to be highly visible as you're driving by at 45 miles per hour. Let's get technical for a minute because there is a widely accepted methodology for determining the amount of parking you need and I think it's worth digging into. A lot of jurisdictions have parking minimums or maximums enshrined in their code, which is worth a whole other video in itself. For most US cities, it's gonna be something like the Institute of Transportation Engineers parking generation methodology. The ITE establishes codes for a wide variety of land uses, including code 813, the freestanding discount superstore, and the forecast parking need is based on the observed utilization per thousand leasable square feet for the particular land use. The estimate is something like three to six parking stalls per thousand leasable square feet for code 813. So let's look at this Walmart Supercenter at the Eastgate Plaza Power Center. It's about 200,000 square feet, so let's say five stalls per thousand square feet. That's a thousand parking stalls just for the Walmart. There are other stores to account for here as well. The parking lot is enormous and it even has EV charging stalls way at the back. The way power centers allocate parking is interesting and it continues to evolve. Besides EV spots, you've got way more merchandise pickup spots these days. You've got expectant mother priority spots and you've got your usual ADA spots. Incidentally, if you're biking to a power center, which has been known to happen on occasion, especially if you don't own a car and you're filming a YouTube video about power centers, an ADA parking sign is usually your best bet for locking up because I don't think any of the cities here started requiring bike parking as a condition of development until like 10 years ago. Unfortunately, a lot of these places like to wrap their ADA signs in padding, which, well, I can only imagine. I have to say, the one place at a power center that actually seems to always have a bike rack is also the place that probably makes the least sense to bike to. But you know, sometimes all you want is a twisted churro and a mocha freeze and, I don't know, maybe a $5 rotisserie chicken you can bungee to your rack. Before we get off parking, let's enjoy a brief interlude at the Galleria at sunset. It's a very typical American mall with all the usual shops, none of which I think are going to be responsible for the demise of any category. You can still build bears, buy edgy clothing, play weird arcade games that dispense tickets you can redeem for like plastic jewelry. There are storefronts that sell food that smells really good when you're anywhere within a hundred foot radius but has negative nutritional value. Yeah, I'm super fun to shop with. There's a food court and I literally shot this video in the noon hour, so that's not a good sign. The parking lot utilization isn't looking too promising either. So I don't know what the plan is here. Like a lot of suburban malls, they've tried to resuscitate things by converting part of it into an outdoor lifestyle center type format, but it's kind of half-hearted. And it is cool that there's a bike shop here, but the bike parking at the bike shop is designed to bend your wheels. So yeah, not today. Also while we're here, let's drop in on the other monster land use in the study area, which is Sunset Station. You know, every casino hotel of any significant size has to have a theme and I couldn't quite figure this one out from the outside so let's drop in and see if we can piece it together. Hotel lobby with an artificial blue sky ceiling, kind of a generic feature for these kinds of places. But let's see, Club Madrid, Bar Seville, the Costa del Sol Oyster Bar, the Bullfighters Bar, Okay, I think I'm starting to get it. Oh, here we go. The pièce de résistance, the Gaudi bar. You don't have to go to Barcelona to see first-rate kind of fractal organic modernist design. You can just take exit 64A off I-515 and then bask in the complexity and sensuality of Gaudi's vision while you play like jacks or better video poker. Okay, I apologize for that. As sort of a cleanse, let's go into the very heart of actual Spain, an urbanist paradise where they would never dream of organizing a collection of hulking big box stores around a massive sprawling parking lot. Uh, 
I mean, mega park, really? I've got more to share on the economic land use and transportation impacts of power centers. But first, brief reminder to drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're into mattress store content. Join the Patreon if you want to fund future twisted churro fueled field visits. And sub count check, the town now has enough subscribers to fill the Superdome. I'm not going to call it whatever the sponsor is this year. It's home of the New Orleans Saints. It dates from 1975 and it's really the last vestige of the domed multi-purpose stadiums of the late 20th century. The Astrodome has been shuttered for years. The Metrodome was demolished in 2014. The Kingdome got imploded decades ago. It's just interesting that the Superdome, which played a key role in one of the most truly upsetting events of this century, is the one that's still standing. Okay, that was a barrel of laughs. Let's just go ahead and state outright that things change. Suburban malls aren't popular anymore, apparently, but there's a lot of turnover in power centers too. The discount superstores keep grabbing market share, and the stores that used to be category killers are now getting killed by platoons of blue delivery vans or by streaming services. Power centers used to be full of places where you could buy music, DVDs, video games, tech equipment. So let's just take a moment to remember the big boxes we've lost. Hang on, I, I just can't believe there isn't a Fry's Electronics anymore. Yeah, it was a big box, a really big box, but that was the most fun place to shop, and the world is worse for not having it. Don't get me wrong, lots of big box stores are still doing just fine, but you know, just because a business is quote unquote successful on its own terms doesn't mean your city should be going out and recruiting them to come to town, which is what happens in a lot of cases. I haven't really talked about the sub-discipline of urban planning that's called economic development on this channel, mostly because I find it kind of misguided. It's a whole field that's organized around cities competing with each other to lure companies and jobs, using incentives and tax breaks and free infrastructure. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's a race to the bottom that just doesn't produce any aggregate social benefit. It's usually a bad deal for taxpayers and a good deal for shareholders, so it's definitely a very aggressive dynamic. The way you view new firms entering your region through an economic development lens is there are positive upstream and downstream impacts, meaning does a new firm have upstream benefits in creating new business for local suppliers or manufacturers, or downstream benefits in terms of bringing good new jobs to the region? Power centers fail at both of these things. Their cheap inventory is usually coming from overseas and definitely out of the region. And the jobs they create are mostly not what you want for a healthy working class in terms of salary or benefits. Power centers are built around simple designs, cheap structures, and low overhead. So let's bring this back to transportation. I would submit to you that the entire business model of power centers is subsidized by near universal auto ownership and enormous amounts of adjacent roadway capacity. These places are unwalkable by design. They sell stuff in sizes you'd be hard pressed to carry home by foot or bike for that matter. They depend on the customer to personally own an expensive depreciating asset and they depend on your local jurisdiction to build and maintain the kind of transportation infrastructure that makes you less safe, less sane, and less healthy. This is symptomatic of a lot of the worst aspects of suburban land use where housing and commercial development is considered cheap because it's been disconnected from any kind of more holistic regional analysis. 
Is this really the way you would organize your retail and residential uses if you wanted safer streets, a healthier population, and a variety of housing and transportation choices? Because what I see here isn't really much of a choice at all. A couple examples of what I'm talking about. Power centers have to be visible, so they have to be on the busiest streets. But the unsignalized accesses have to be right in, right out with non-traversable medians on the major street and usually the approach to, to prevent queuing and blocking situations that create safety issues. But it ends up hurting connectivity and that's usually bad news for people walking and biking. And then if they do need a full access, it means you need a signalized intersection, which is at least half a million dollars, and it imposes additional delay on everyone else who has to travel through the intersection. You only hope the city required the power center to pay for it as a condition of development, but more than likely, you paid for it, at least one way or the other. Let's go back to that Walmart Supercenter. The ITE publishes a trip generation methodology with estimates for vehicle trips at different times of day for different land uses, similar to the parking generation approach. Again, it's code 813, which is about four vehicle trips per thousand square feet at the PM peak hour, when traffic is usually heaviest. That's 800 vehicle trips in or out of this Walmart. The methodology is actually a little more complicated because you need to account for people who are trip chaining or visiting multiple stores at the same power center. But 800 vehicles in an hour is probably an entire approach lane at a signal and about half the capacity of a freeway lane. Now apply the same methodology to all the other land uses in the area and you can understand why the traffic engineers designed the transportation network the way they did. It's all connected. Finally, let's talk about the I-515 interchange at Sunset Road. Given everything we just talked about, you can see why these have to be monster ramp terminals. You've got four approach lanes coming off the freeway with huge pork chop pedestrian islands. Not a pleasant place to be. I'd just share that I work to the state DOT and I can tell you that huge power centers love to be located right next to freeway interchanges and state DOTs do not love huge power centers being right on top of their interchanges. The DOTs are generally in the business of maintaining regional mobility and freight movement, and huge phalanxes of cars queuing back onto the freeway mainline because it's noon and the whole planet decided they wanted a double-double animal style with fries is not the kind of travel the DOT wants consuming precious freeway capacity. So you decide, walkable main streets with dense housing and lots of nearby shopping and dining and amenities, or a huge cluster of power centers surrounded by strodes and residential subdivisions with single family houses and disconnected street networks. It is a tough call. That's all I've got. Thanks for watching and thanks to the patrons who helped fund this expedition, which took place in triple digit heat and required significant hydration and electrolyte replacement. Keep the great topic suggestions coming and let me know if you have any egregious land uses that you want me to dig into in this series. I'll be back with a new episode next week and I'll see you then.